really problem in a short notice, even during this COVID times. Mahatma Gandhi Cancer Hospital Research Institute, we have started 15 years back in 2006 and we completed 15 years this year. We have completed more than one lakh. So, when we started, actually, there was no facility, uh, state of the art facility in Vishakapatnam. We started with the cobalt, uh, cobalt unit, cobalt 68, a small mammogram, small ultrasound and excellent machine and small lab with six beds. So now we have reached, uh, we are running around 220 beds uh, state of the art cancer hospital, which has grown over time. Though we have not started everything at a single go, but we have so many paths where the first linear accelerator, the first brachytherapy unit, the first CT simulator, the first PET CT scan, the first robotic surgery unit, first bone marrow transplant unit, the first 3D mammography unit, chromosynthesis, etc. But we had the opportunity because first is not because nobody else started. But we could uh, get all these things because of the constant trust and support given by my community, my seniors, my teachers, my friends here. And then I owe a lot to the entire team of Mahatma and the hospitals. So all the facilities are there except product to say except product therapy, everything is available in Vishakapatnam in other Pradesh. And the whatever facilities we have, technology we have. Even combined states, many of the hospitals, they don't have everything under the same roof. So, we uh, really, we can say we are proud that we are here with all the technology and the expertise. And uh, once again, I thank everyone for the constant support throughout this, our journey. So, our journey is definitely satisfactory, but it has been very challenging because of so many factors. In the journey we have started, we have taken some challenging patients like starting robotic surgery in Vishakapatna. Because we never thought we would ever have robotic surgery uh, that early, that is in 2018 to the 90s. But we could take the decision only because of the, our passion towards the cancer care and bringing technology to the uh, Vishakapatna. So our main motto was like, Nobody should go out of Vaisal because of the lack of technology or lack of facility. So that was the only aim in bringing all these technologies to Vishakhapatna. Fortunately, I got the entire good team of doctors who can be, who can carry this, actually the vision forward uh, of the management of our hospital. Very good team of young oncologist team we have. And uh, very fortunate and uh, very proud of my team. So robotic surgery uh, and one more uh, good recently we actually yesterday we had a one more CME with radiologists and we had a testament today because we uh, achieved two milestones and uh, we started uh, to we brought two new technologies to the city one technology what we brought to the city is a very high end time of flight PET CT scan that's a very high end PET CT scan where Resolution is very high, even a very, very small millimeter level lesions also can be identified because it changes the management of oncology. And very small dose, half of the dose of uh, regular conventional PET CT is enough to get the best images. So, the 5 millimeters of PET CT is enough for that. Multiple PET CTs, when they get, they can they will get less, less dose of millimeter radiation also. And uh, it is uh, as, as you know, it's a, because of the resolution, we can change the management of a patient. And it works with the help of artificial intelligence also. Even if the doctor misses or, uh, you know, which, uh, those those patients which can be missed easily in a regular conventional PET CT, these things cannot be missed in this PET CT because of the artificial intelligence. A lot of data is in, went into this machine, so it will give its own uh, uh, opinion also. 
and we brought one uh, new uh, treatment plan, state of the art treatment planning system, very fast, ultra fast uh, planning system that is the ray station, with a form of adaptive, which will give a form of adaptive radiotherapy. During radiotherapy, we start the treatment with a plan, but throughout the radiotherapy, we don't change the plan generally. But during the treatment, the tumor may shrink and reduce in size, so normal structures may come into the radiotherapy treatment area. So, in this uh, adaptive radiotherapy, the art machine automatically uh, responds to the response of the tumor and automatically shrinks the treatment field so that the side effects of the treatment will be very less and a very high dose of radiotherapy can, given, can be given to the tumor. That's the, our hospital is the first hospital in the country to have this planning system for a non-proton therapy because only they use that high-end that high end pro treatment planning system only for proton therapy. So non-proton therapy, the our hospital is the first time in the country. And we have achieved two more two milestones like we completed 200 plus robotic surgeries for oncology and 50, 50 bone marrow transplants till now after we started the program. And here we are actually we were finding difficult to arrange funds for the children who are getting bone marrow transplant and poor people who are getting who need bone marrow transplant. Off late there's a lot of support from the government also. Government has included some types of bone marrow transplant into the ROV scheme, wherein some patients, we are, many of the patients who are poor, we, can, we are getting the treatment free of cost to them. And we have other uh, sources of funding like Cancer Foundation, and we have crowdfunding, and other individual donors are also helping to get this bone marrow transplant because cost of the treatment can be uh, sometimes substantial. So, till now, all the cases are. Uh, uh, very successful and our methods are on par with the global, national and international hospitals. Now today, we thought uh, as a, we want to learn actually from the experience what we have gained uh, in the journey uh, of the last 200 cases of uh, robotic surgery. Because when we started the technology, generally we say so many things about the advantages of technology and we wanted to analyze the, actually the advantages are we in real or it's only theoretical and we wanted to you know share these experiences with you. So then uh, we planned this uh, CMU uh, with the relevant uh, fields like robotic surgery is more relevant in gynae, general surgery, then uh, thoracic, GI surgery and genital urinary surgery. These are the four uh, places where it is very very relevant. So, we invited all the specialists and practicing specialists post-graduate from those fields. So now, uh, Dr. Chandra Kalyan is our uh, robotic surgery lead in our hospital, who himself completed more than 100 uh, robotic surgeries. So he is, he is analyzed and he is going to tell, tell us about the robotic surgery, what, is, what are our experiences, what is the experience of the patients and uh, how it is beneficial uh, to the uh, future um, future treatment model, future future treatments. But probably more, uh, what I feel is more number of students should take up this uh, uh, facility and use this technology which is already available in our in our vicinity. Uh, then you know more number of then the more number of people use robotic surgery, then the cost will come down. If the utilization is more, cost will come down. For that purpose, what we have done is we talked to the institute, the um, uh, parent company of robotic surgery. So we are starting a observer program, a fellowship program uh, for postgraduates and people who are uh, young surgeons who are interested in uh, picking up the robotic surgery. So there are there is a registration counter outside. We have created and forms are there. Whoever is interested, then you can register. Basing on the credentialing of the institute, we will. Uh, call the people for fellowship or after question. So that probably students can uh, use this, have young uh, consultants can use this opportunity to get the training or at least get the exposure so that if they are interested they can go forward with the facility. Now I uh, invite Dr. Chandra Kalyan uh, for giving the lecture on the topic. Thank you so much for your patience.
Yes, I will. Teachers, students, doctors, colleagues, and my dear friends, good evening. Thank you, Dr. Mukherjee, for this kind of introduction. At the outset, I once again want to thank you all for being with us, for supporting us, and being here today as we unfold the journey of robotic surgery and our experience of two hundred plus robotic surgery cases. Success is a journey and it is not a destination, and it is best when it is shared with others. So, these are few of the happy patients of 200 surgical cases who had underwent robotic surgery. And I would like to present to you a testimony, a patient testimony. So that was very satisfying. At the end of the day, as a surgeon, when you see a happy patient, you sleep peacefully because after all the hard work and creative, this is what we expect. So this journey has begun in the second half of 2017. When Dr. Kulir had an interesting discussion with us regarding what is that that is lacking in the Department of Surgical Oncology in a tertiary care center like us, and what is that that would become a norm in the coming 10 years. So with the experience that we had at Tata Mangal Center during 2014 and 15, we attended a word called robotic center. Not knowing what is ahead. And then there was a lot of searching, research was done, and analysis was done, and then a decision was taken. So, why did we choose robotics? In the first place, why would we accept a new technology? The first thing is the features it has. It definitely has a technology which is out of the box and is, and is very apt for our department, and it is user friendly. The user interface is easy and the user experience is also good. And when it comes to safety and security while performing the surgery and the safety of the patient, it is impeccable. And regarding the flexibility, when initially a robotic surgery program was thought about, we thought of uh, making a vertical stream of Mahatma Gandhi Cancer Hospitals, which is called the Sunrise Institute of Robotic Surgery, wherein apart from oncology, other specialities would also chip in and utilize the facility and in the process serve more and more patients and, and, and increase the uh, awareness regarding the newer technology. Regarding the interoperability, this has a peculiar feature of integration of various services. For example, the tile pro view is one thing which is integrated into the surgeon's console wherein CT scans, MRIs, X-ray or mammogram, ultrasound images can be uh, integrated into the system which are very useful especially during surgery when we are stuck with something. So the rest of the things innovation and ecosystem was uh, on the management and alas we had this uh, robotic, robotic surgical system for the first time in the state of Africa at Mahatma Gandhi Cancer Hospital which I This is our third OT, the women is a surgical and then the training started, we had the basic training at our place and the advanced training, I had the advanced training at IRCAD which is the Institute for Research of Cancer of Digestive Systems in Strasbourg, France and here is Dr. Solimo who is an expert in uh, human invasive GI and thoracic surgery services and the journey continued. By August 2018 we could finish 50 cases and in the next month we had the opportunity of conducting a gynec oncology CME where we presented the first uh, live workshop of gynec surgery using a robotic panel. 
And by June 2019, we made it a habit and we started the concept of NG Omicron, the idea of doing this on a regular basis for knowledge, sharing and learning as well. But unfortunately, 2020 and 2021 had this all our plans. And now today, in spite of all the uh, tough times of COVID, we could still continue the program. We had done a few cases during COVID also. Being an on-COVID hospital, patients were also comfortable coming and getting the emergency surgery done even during those periods. And now we are at the landmark of completing 200 cases in August 2021. So without saying a good team is a key for a good outcome. At this juncture, I would like to thank all my patients who had actually put their faith and trust in us and underwent the procedure and reap the benefits of robotic surgery. I thank the community and our management who have given us the opportunity to learn and to perform. And especially thank my anesthesia team, Dr. Praveen and his team for wonderfully handling patients in the perioperative and the postoperative period. To thank the nursing team, the supportive staff, the PD and logistic support uh, from Mrs. Antaraj as well. So, what was the core technology in robotics? We don't want to stress much on this, but for the sake of postgraduates, this is the robotic surgical, Dunancy robotic surgical system, and it has three components. <coughs> this is called the surgeon's, surgeon's console, where the surgeon comfortably sits and operates. That is the surgeon's console, you have to put the head inside, and there is a, uh, this kind of binocular vision which enables a 3D. Uh, image of what is happening inside the body and there are joysticks with which we manipulate the robotic system and there are a lot of patterns which are used to control the camera and uh, the uh, energy devices. And this is what is called the uh, patient pad and it has four arms, one for the camera and the rest of the three arms to hold various instruments. And this is a vision card which is a brain of the system and all these signals are processed through this and translated on the vision card where uh, the, process, the whole process happens. So most of the times there is a common misconception that when you utter the word as robotic surgery, most of the people think that the robot is pre-programmed to do a procedure. No, this is a kind of slave and uh, no master slave kind of robot where only the surgeon performs and the uh, movements what are done, whatever are done by the surgeon are replicated in a much better manner in the patient body. So, over centuries of open surgery and decades of laparoscopic surgery, we still had our limitations. Uh, not because of the expertise of, not, not because of human expertise, but there were some technical limitations in laparoscopic surgery in certain procedures. So, how did robotic surgery overcome these deficiencies? The first and foremost thing is the vision. We all know, as uh, many are senior and laparoscopic surgeons, how Difficult it is to perform a laparoscopic surgery without a trained camera person. And the kind of camera what is uh, into the system is one which is surgeon controlled, which alleviates all that pain. It is it has a 3D vision, which is uh, three times more magnified than the laparoscopic vision and ten times more magnified than the uh, open vision. Because of such kind of vision, the depth perception is well understood over a period of time and the tactile feedback which is not there is overcome with this kind of image. So it has a stable and immersive vision as well. The second most important part of this technology or the deficit which we, which was overcome from laparoscopy is the listed instruments. Unlike in laparoscopy where we have rigid instrumentation, this uh, these arms in the robotic uh, platform have a hat converted into an 8 millimeter instrument and inserted into the body. It has a dexterity which is much better than the normal hand and a, great, a good range of movements. And because of such kind of dexterity, the precision is even more better. One more thing which, uh, which is incorporated into it is the motion scaling technology. Whenever we operate on a, lapro, uh, on a laparoscopic procedure, when we are close to vital structures like vessels or some important nerves, any untoward movement can actually damage these structures. But 
In this platform, the motion scaling technology enables to scale down the motion of uh, the, uh, the wrist inside to whatever uh, is prefixed. So a 5 centimeter motion outside on the uh, console can be into a translated into a 1 centimeter or 1.5 centimeter motion uh, uh, procedure. And definitely the tremor has been eliminated. And the third thing is the intuitive motion. Unlike in laparoscopy where uh, to move towards the right, the screen acts as the program and we have to move the instruments towards the left, outside the body. In this, it is intuitive. When you move the instruments towards the right, it moves on to the right. So it is basically like open surgery which is translated into minimal invasive approach. So that is the basic reason why the learning curve is much more shorter than laparoscopy. And this is one reason why this technology can be uh, you know, easily accepted by the younger generation as well. So it incorporates newer technologies, collaborative surgery wherein dual console technology is available, we can, uh, we, can apply to, we can apply for another console and teaching becomes even more easier when the senior surgeon also sits in the second console and takes over the health certificate. The skill simulation in a cricket crazy nation like us, skill simulation is like uh, net practice. In fact, it is said that uh, from the intuitive side, every surgeon has to have at least 10 minutes of simulator experience before he operates, so that we get accustomed to the system quite often. And the advanced imaging technology like the Firefly, which enables uh, identifying uh, indesiring green limited wavelength of light through a special camera. And this enables to identify vessels in a more precise manner. And the advanced instrumentation, now we have robotic staplers, robotic energy devices or the vessel sealants which make these uh, surgeries even more easier. And the future is going to be a single side surgery through the navel. So, what are the various specialities that we, uh, we could perform during these two years? Majority of them were gynec surgeries, endometrium and uh, cervical cancers. The next in line was GI cancers of which most of them were rectal malignancies and all of them had received neoadjuvant chemotherapy, neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapies and a few of them were colon, colonic malignancies and stomach malignancies as well. The next in shape was thoracic of which most of the procedures were esophageal mobilizations for esophageal middle, mid third and lower third esophageal cancers and thymectomies. You know, this stands next, we had the opportunity of doing a few partial nephrectomies and radical nephrectomies and radical cystectomy as well. We had the expertise of uh, outside doctors who had enabled us to do a few prostate cancers as well. And miscellaneous, a few thyroid cancer, colon malignancies, retrograder tumors have been operated using these platforms. The organ specific wise, these are the percentages. So, I would like to show you a few challenging cases. Uh, when the robotic system was first approved by the FDA, the first procedure was, uh, which was approved was the robotic prostatectomy. Uh, though we have, uh, uh, we have done a few, but then I wanted to show something else. We are more interested in kidney cancers. So, we all know that uh, this is an intense tumor, but the kind of presentation which is written in the book is obsolete now. And the advent of imaging, we, we started to find newer, uh, smaller and smaller kidney lesions incidentally. So, moving from the uh, old standard, the radical nephrectomy, partial nephrectomy, or nephron sparing surgery has come to move, where we remove only the tumor with a margin of normal kidney, and this preserves the kidney function, the rest of the kidney uh, adds to the kidney function. And it is seen that in studies around 30 percent of the patients who had undergone radical nephrectomy ended up with chronic renal failure and requiring dialysis. So why robotics in nephrectomy or partial nephrectomy? So in general, whatever is for minimal invasive surgery applies for this as well. At the same time, when you do partial nephrectomy, two important things are one is the vessel delineation, which is the renal artery and the renal vein properly delineated. Sometimes the tumor might have an axillary vessel which simply can be clamped and the tumor can be removed without much pain. Once the tumor is excised, the 
radiography which has to be done has to be done in a certain period of time which we call it as warm ischemia time. So these are two important things. So because of this platform, the procedure itself has become short, warm ischemia times are short, and there is lesser blood loss and shorter hospital stay. So this is one case which we perform. Because of vision, we can clearly see the plane between the coloric pad and the uh, perineal pit pad. The coronary immobilized and the ureter identified, the ureter will lift out, lift it out, and dissect it along with its vicinity. Uh, and there is the renal vein and the renal artery. You can see the distant instrumentation, the, the maneuvering which made it easy to encircle the uh, renal artery there. And now this is the zeratus being removed off the uh, kidney to identify the tumor. This is a low per tumor, a 3 to 4 centimeters tumor with an endophytic uh, component, more of an endophytic component. Most of these tumors usually require endoscopic ultrasound, but with, uh, with uh, uh, you know, the kind of vision which we had, we could be able to mark it, with the margin being marked all around. And then this is clad, the renal artery is clad. So now starts the time, the tumor being excised. Because we clamp the renal artery, the bleeding is comparatively minimal. A wide fixation of the mass is being done. And now you can see how easily we will be able to do a renal artery. It is just like how we do suturing in an open surgery. The long time time in this patient was 18 minutes. It means to say we clamp the uh, renal artery for 18 minutes, excise the tumor, and completely secure the tumor slices and do the renal artery. So a little deep into the data which we could gather. So most of the time the advantages are minimal blood loss, smaller insulin causing lesser pain, and uh, mean hospital stay, time to blood work at very So these are four things if we looked into all the procedures which we could lay our hands on. In kidney and prostate it was around 200 ml mean blood loss and the bowel function recovered immediately on post of day one. The median pain score on a scale of 0 to 10 on day 2, the pain score has come down to 2 or even 1 in certain cases. And the average length of stay was 3.75 days for prostate and 3 days for kidney. And coming to urinary bladder, the blood loss was a little more as we had to even address the bowel to do an ideal condo. And uh, the bowel recovery took uh, two, more, 2 more days extra, so the mean was around 3 days. And the average length of stay was 7 days. So the next, next most common procedure and the next level of acceptance after prostate was into gynec surgery, gynecological surgeries, both for benign and endometrial cancers. For endometrial cancers, today it is the gold standard that we, we perform minimal invasive surgery. So this is an image which shows the comparison of uh, uh, you know the suture sites. We you know, sometimes use the lower abdominal incisions and the transverse phalanx steel or the muscle cutting male incisions. But when it comes to uh, minimal invasive surgery, there are three or four incisions which are around a centimeter of size. So we looked at a comparative study of three surgical methods for hysterectomy and endometrial cancer, robotic assisted, laparoscopic, and laparotomy. If you see, uh, when compared to open, it is always better, there are fewer complications, but when compared to laparoscopic as well, you could see that mean total number of lymph node yield was higher, the mean hospital stay is more or less equal. The complication rates are much less, and the chance of conversion, even in these patients, is 50% to that of laparoscopic procedure. So, this is a video of a robotic radical hysterectomy which we have performed. We all know that uh, radical hysterectomy is about making the spaces, the paramental and the paramental uh, para para recycle spaces. And identifying the ureter, then you identify the ureter after we have finished the lymphadenectomy, the retail island is identified, and that is the uh, operated cardiac artery, and that is the uh, uterine artery which divides both the spaces. And that kind of dissection makes it possible to ligate the uterine artery at the margin for a view of 5 or 5 or 3 radical hysterectomies. And 
even the dissection of the ureter. It, it is so elegant and then it is so it is so easy with this uh, newer platform. There you can see the vessel that is being supplied to the ureter from the uterine. This part which is dissected and uh, dilated. And even at the uh, bladder pillars or what we call the vesico vaginal fold, the ureter dissection is very easy even on the opposite side. On the same side, most of the times it is easy, but on the opposite side, because of the rigid instrumentation in the lab, it becomes a little difficult. But with a twisted instrument and the kind of vision, that dissection is also made possible with minimal blood loss. So in data once again look into endometrial cancer, the mean blood loss was 130 ml. Most of our recovery was fast because we never touched the bar and most of day one they were fine. The mean pain scores on day two were around one to two. And the average length of stay is three days. For cervix, it was the blood loss was a little more and the average length of stay was more or less the same. Next in line, we had done a lot of colorectal cancers and especially the rectal dissection. Whatever we have observed in our experience of these uh, 200 cases is robotic surgery is one such platform which makes rectal dissection look so easy and it makes the surgeon more comfortable, especially in male patients and obese individuals. Imagine an obese male patient with a rectal tumor at around 7 cm where you have to do an ultra low anterior dissection. The space is limited, in a huge patient, it is a, it is a burrow and practically impossible to see with all the smoke and you need to have a strong person to retract the bowel to give you, to show you some things. So this is a comparison once again between the incisions and uh, what I want to show uh, what is anterior dissection. It starts off with uh, dissection just below the superior rectal artery where we will be able to easily enter into the holy plane and that's the left ureter and the descent to it is the what you call gonadal vessel and this is the IMA that is being uh, dissected at the root. All the lymph nodes are dissected off the structure, increasing the nodal area. That is the IMV and the region flexion, which is being uh, isolated and dilated. And a complete medial to lateral mobilization of the descending colon is done, and then this splenic flexion is brought down along with the transverse colon. And the best part is uh, the rectal dissection, and this is the posterior dissection you can see of lateral speed. And a non fog camera. The kind of view, with this kind of view, the chance of injury to the uh, hypogastric plexus is almost near to none. So, this is the lateral dissection. Once you finish the posterior dissection, the lateral dissection is done on either side, so the right and the left. And this is the anterior dissection in a female patient where the uterus is reached and we are dissecting the rectal vaginal fold. So, normally, if this has to be done laparoscopically, uh, with the uh, experience of doing laparoscopy as well. We had to struggle a number of times to be in the camera and to once again get reoriented to the place and you know it was pretty difficult. So in GS surgeries, most of the times the length of stay was restricted to four to five days because of the uh, delay in uh, post of power recovery and mean blood loss was less and pain score is once again you know, on day three. Esophagectomy is one other morbid procedure. The mortality rate is around 3% and the morbidity rate is around 15 to 20 percent. So this is the video of what is esophagectomy. The most important constraint in this is space and the patient lies prone. So the margin of error is zero. Minimal uh, injury to either of the structure that is in are most of the times it is the pericardium or the great vessels or the trachea or the eye or the uh, vasitis vein. There you can see the, uh, the vagus now, the branch of the vagus, the cardiac branch is also preserved. And it looks like as though we are working in a tunnel. If not for that view and that kind of instrumentation, that dissection would not be possible. This is the uh, esophagus being dissected from the posterior membrane, membrane of the trachea. This is the azygous vein, which is dissected free and ligated and clear. So, two other structures which we tend to uh, injure is one is the thoracic duct, which lies in the space between the azygous and the aorta. Normally, in a prone position, we have to look 
from under to identify the uh, thoracic cut. But in this platform, it is enabled and we can really eliminate the thoracic cut and prepare to prevent post operative analytics. Station 7 lymph nodes, the subcarinal lymph nodes being removed. This is a dangerous area. Any injury to the post numerous area of the trachea is going to cause a huge uh, fistula. And the management of such kind of patients is difficult. This is one of the cases in a 19 year old young girl who received uh, near joint hemorrhage therapy. And uh, we, there's a lot of fibrosis, and they had to remove all the tissue from the iota as well. These are thymic, uh, thymic incisions which are displayed. This uh, conventional or the standard is an open medium sternotomy. And there are various approaches for thymectomy, but minimal invasive platform has made thymectomies uh, in terms of patient care much, much better. So, this is a robotic thymectomy. I would like to show you both the right and the left uh, thymic approaches that we did. Uh, this is a 16 to 7 centimeter thymic mass. There's a training nerve. And uh, the SVC, the mass is being uh, separated from the uh, right intermammary brain. The thyrothymic ligament being divided, and the vessels that uh, drain into the vagus are separated. And all the fat from the pericardium is uh, removed, especially in patients with what uh, you call biosynergies. That is the left line which you see. So we have cleared everything from the left side as well. This is the left sided approach. This was a very difficult case, though the mass was small. It was like as though I was sitting on a hat and operating. Uh, once again, I would emphasize that it's not because of this kind of uh, precision to remove that mass without any injury to the nerve or the pericardium or the structures would have been next to impossible. If you see, my camera is still within the port. I don't even have space to get into the thoracic cavity. That was the difficulty which we faced. So these of even though it was morbid, uh, luckily we could get away without any uh, major lung complications or arrhythmias. We had a share of problems, especially with uh, elastomotic leaks. But then the blood loss was minimal and uh, the average length of stay was 9 days. For thymic lesions, it was 4 days. Pain score is also less. So, this is another robotic thyroidectomy which was done. Normally, thyroids don't, uh, most of the people don't think that thyroids need a minimal invasive approach, but when it comes to scars on the neck and awkward scars for young patients, humiliated small lesions that can, that we can get away with either benign or malignant, and there we can get away with the hemithyroidectomy. A minimal invasive approach definitely scores. Uh, the incision is around the axilla, antiporter axilla, and we uh, reach the neck, lift the strap muscles, reach the thyroid, subcapsular dissection is done, the upper pole is taken down, and there you see the recurrent lamp chamber. This patient, he himself is a, a, a medico, and he had a pretty smooth course, post of day one, his voice had no issues, that the very very segment being cut, and the uh, right hemithyroidectomy being done. Preserving the uh, superior thyroid as well. So that is a with a rectal specimen that was shown. I have two interesting cases uh, to bring to your notice. This is one patient with a BMI of 15.3. This lady is a petite lady, married, uh, and Paris. We had to uh, do a low anterior dissection, and she's so thin that she couldn't even occupy half of the table. And for robotic surgery, port placement plays a very important role when it comes to SI system. We have the SI system, and there has to be at least an 8 cm distance when we place the ports. But there was no possibility of placing that kind of ports in uh, this lady, and so we had to bring it to 7 cm. Uh, a 7 cm distance between the ports, and usually for a uh, anti resection, it is a multi quadrant surgery. The colon, entire colon, distal transverse colon, spinal flexure, descending colon, sigmoid, and rectum has to be mobilized. So it is done in two phases. First, the colon is mobilized, and then the rectal procedure is done. But 
this is the case where we have to decide upon doing it in a single in single docking method. So we had uh, a different kind of port placement to use these three ports to initially uh, decide uh, the polar and then hop the port to the opposite side without changing the patient card. The procedure went on smoothly. The resection went on very fine, but uh, we had to extract the specimen with a small balance incision. Everything was fine except for the scar neuralgia which we developed, and it took a little while for our pain management team to handle that pain. Looking at this image, uh, it would be wrong for me to ask a question, but then can we identify the head and tail? Yes, based on yellow pins, this, this is the thigh of the patient that's the abdomen. She is a 140 kg old lady with a BMI of 48.4 who required a hysterectomy for endometrial hyperplasia and severe bleeding. She was advised to go to centers outside by side. Fortunately, we could counsel them and we actually had to bring robotic uh, bariatric progress and then place the progress to the surgery. If it was actually not sufficient, and at this point, I would like to once again thank my anesthesia team. They had done a wonderful job because this kind of patient, we cannot put the patient in a steep preliminary position. But even then, our team allowed us to maintain a certain amount of preliminary uh, uh, position and we successfully could finish the surgery. So today, as, uh, if we look at uh, the phase of health industry in the state of Andhra Pradesh, we are happy to know that Vizag occupies the first place. After uh, previously, it used to be Hyderabad. Uh, when I first joined this organization in 2009, we used to send a lot of patients for various procedures to Hyderabad. But today, we do not lack the expertise, the experience, or the technology in Vizag and. This was made possible because of all, uh, all you see the doctors, teachers, and visionaries like my Dr. Kamurli. And so, in the process, we have started knowledge sharing, and this is the first uh, Paragon of a conference which we conducted. And we had an opportunity to give a live demonstration of what uh, uh, expect to me in this conference. And the who's uh, the, big, the big names of Paragonology uh, uh, have attended, and there is a good knowledge sharing process. In the meeting. And then we decided to do the NGO Oncocon, which, like I said, we wanted to do it on a regular basis in 2019 July. This was a two day live workshop. We had doins in the field of robotics and surgical oncology from all over India. And that's the welcome note by Dr. T. Sudhuneswagar. We have our own Subhana sir, and we have Dr. Somshaker there on the podium. And it was a feast with various specialists in various uh, departments. Uh, Dr. Anand Krishnan, who um, is, is the in charge of Curie Institute, uh, Euro Oncology Institute in Chennai, and uh, Dr. Kagan Prakash, who is the robotic surgeon in the department of uh, Euro Oncology in Tata Hospital, Dr. Pravin Kamal, who is a colorectal surgeon and hypex uh, surgeon, and all these uh, eminent personalities had come to this, and we had live demonstrations. And there's a split in time. Unfortunately, we couldn't continue because of COVID. And one other important aspect that happened in that conference was the rowing group. The NGQ people were gracious enough to bring this rowing robot. This is a, a sample of a robot in a vehicle wherein you can lay your hands on it and see how it works. This is a costly process that has to be done. And we could get it from Chennai to Vizag for the same conference. And 400 people visited that stall, and of which 140 young postgraduates from various institutes had a first hand experience. So, considering this thing, we thought after uh, you know, seeing the benefits of surgery, uh, after seeing the um, you know, kind of platform it is, knowing the, uh, the learning curve is small or less. We thought of starting some kind of observerships for the students so that they get oriented to the system and depending on their interest and expertise, they can be inducted into fellowship programs which we would shortly start as mentioned by Dr. Mahi. So thank you, thank you all for your patient hearing. <laughs>
prepared any queries or questions.